A tragedy has occurred, which started right here with the taxation of trade routes and has now engulfed our entire planet in the oppression of the Trade Federation. What's up, mini nerds? This video will break down the free trade zones. Why, even though this may sound like a tiring economics lesson, it is crucial to understanding the Sith takeover of the galaxy, involving everyone from Plagueis to Tarkin, great deceptions and assassinations, and will shape the events from the final decades of the Republic on through the New Republic era. I promise it is worth it, and adds to Star Wars in the same way that the realistic lived-in environments and drawing from real-world mythology does. But first, I want to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. I use ExpressVPN for everything from protection to being able to watch shows that aren't normally available to me. And by using the link in the description, you can get three months completely free. Major ISPs all track and even sell your search data. But with ExpressVPN, there is no log, and you are not using your personal IP address. So it's the only true way to be incognito. But like all good security, when it works perfectly, you don't notice it. So I really want to stress how you can use ExpressVPN to have more fun and freedom. By simply downloading their app to your computer or any of these devices, you can access things from different regions. For example, I'm in the US, and on Netflix we can't see things like Rick and Morty, Lord of the Rings, South Park, or Impractical Jokers. But these are available in the UK or in Canada. Switching is really easy, so with just a few clicks, I'm able to get a whole lot more out of my streaming services that I'm already paying for. So use the link down in the description for three months free, and it will get you tons of extra shows and movies out of the streaming services you're already paying for. Generally, a free trade zone means that no tariffs will be slapped on goods sent between countries in this area, like Canada, the US, and Mexico being in NAFTA. Everyone. NAFTA costs those jobs. Hates. I would like to renegotiate it. NAFTA. And this helps to lower prices on goods, but can also export whole industries and cause massive job loss. The United States is really good at growing corn, and we ship a lot of corn to Mexico. In turn, the United States buys a lot of avocados in the other direction. And often, that arrangement works out really well. But what if there's something that two countries are equally good at making? Mexican labor is cheaper. But before NAFTA, that really didn't matter. By the time a Mexican product made it across the border, it'd be slapped with a tax. So Mexican manufacturers were never really a threat. And certain industries in the US were heavily protected by taxes. Now, the Republic had policies for millennia to incentivize settlers to move out of the core. But back then, it was often free land and freedom from any real authority. They just wanted people to get out there and start developing places, knowing that they would eventually all be tied together through necessary mutual trade. With notable families like the Tarkins coming to be royalty out in the Sesuana, a family that kept alive the stories of their brave ancestors that fled the crumbling lower levels of Coruscant, knowing their best hope back home was to grind away for generations just to end up in slightly less dark, slightly less dangerous levels, without any real hope of dwelling in the sunlight with senators as neighbors. But out in the wild west of the galaxy, you could try your hand at homesteading, with all the freedom, opportunity, and danger that that brought. Centuries later, in 124 BBY, the Galactic Senate formed these new free trade zones with the public claim that it would help grow the galactic economy, helping to tie the goals of peoples throughout the stars, raising the quality of life for all, and helping to prevent war as no planet was an island, but all interdependent on the goods and services of their neighbors. Cynical observers pointed out that this bill was naive at best. At worst, it was an inside plot by wealthy senators hoping to get kickbacks from the megacorps as they were the companies that were best able to move into these zones that filled up the majority of the mid and outer rim. The megacorps already had the capital, networks, and expertise needed to dominate their sector, so they just moved everything into these areas and increased their profit margins. Many senators were found to get a cut, corruption that the Senate Guard was supposed to expose, and it did reveal occasionally, but even these boys in blue were known to be corrupt as well. Everyone seeing that their leadership was essentially hereditary, and that the highest ranking ones enjoyed rubbing elbows with the powerful in penthouse parties. The corporate alliance was, ironically, a sort of union of megacorps that all worked together to wield political power, and by exploiting these FTZs, the Trade Federation would be the standout economic champions. Already for at least a hundred years before this, the Nymoidian-run Megacorp had legal ownership of warships like the Munifex Light Cruiser and Capital Class Heavy Munitions Cruiser, as well as thousands of starfighters and smaller transports. At a time when the Republic had no standing military, the corporations were on their own to protect themselves from the countless pirates and local warlords that they would have to come in contact with through galactic trade. 
In fact, as the Republic pushed development further and further away from the core, the legitimate need for a defense force only increased, to the point that the Trade Defense Force would become the largest standing military in the galaxy. Officially, they're just security guards. Not an army, but functionally there was no difference. As they provided everything for security for their workers and industrial cities in the form of a police force on the ground, to fleets protecting their solar systems, and special forces actively dealing out justice by hunting down pirate coves across the galaxy. But they made sure they played nice with the judicial forces and senate guard, making sure to never step on any powerful toes in the capital. With this FTZ formation, certain industrial sectors were destroyed in the core, but everyone up top from the chancellor down to the upper middle class folk usually only saw the good side of this push for a galactic economy. And an even more twisted aspect of the dark side of these free trade zones was that unlike the homesteading times of the Old Republic expansion, there really wasn't any promising new place for those in the core who just lost their jobs. If anything, they were now just forced to move to work for the corporations that were operating in these FTZs. So whether it be working under Preox Morlana or the Trade Federation, you were still just an employee renting some place far from home in order to do the same job, producing the same goods, and getting paid less for it. Not a self-made homesteading family on an uncharted world. And all this time, a major player was often ignored. While the corporations themselves were slammed for their practices, public ire never seemed to turn towards the intergalactic banking clan. They set credit policy all across the galaxy from sector to republic level. And of course, the Clone Wars was the best thing to ever happen to the Moon bankers, as both the CIS and Republic were begging for loans to keep the war going. Bankruptcy is not necessary, my friends. If we pass Senator Sam's bill to open new lines of credit, we will gain access to the needed funds. But this bill essentially deregulate the banks? A small price to pay to finance the war, is it not? Perhaps some unexpected bloodshed on Coruscant uh, may change a few minds. The bombing of the power generator has been confirmed as a separatist attack! We need a bank loan to get more troops! Now! What are we waiting for? To ensure the safety of the Republic, we must deregulate the banks. My people are drafting an emergency appropriations bill that would raise funds. From the banking clan? Yes, of course. The IGBC would provide loans to their favored megacorps, enabling even greater acceleration over their domination of the FTZs. To the point that you have monopolies the likes of which most people had hoped were the relics of history, and things like the far-off corporate sector, that formed hundreds of years earlier to avoid regulations, which I covered in detail in the last video. In the 70s BBY, voices in the Senate were finally calling for the freed trade zones to be reformed. Higo Damask was the head of a powerful investment house connected to the banking clan, Damask Holdings, and he could see the writing on the wall, so he just played both sides. Publicly, Damask Holdings would act like the typical corrupt corporate supporting lobbyist, pushing for no regulations, while Higo would personally negotiate backroom deals with the Trade Federation leadership and powerful senators. Better still, perhaps the time has come to impose a tax on the free trade zones to supply the outlying systems with the funds they require. Angry rebuttals spewed from the stations of the Rim Faction worlds, as well as from those belonging to the Trade Federation, the Commerce Guild, the Techno Union, and the Corporate Alliance. How wonderfully and predictably the Senate had deteriorated over the course of 20 years. For the screens that filled the rotunda, Hovercams captured Valorum's sad expression of impotence. You got it so the public saw the reformers as victorious, when these new laws placed regulations that seemed to have put essentially higher taxes on the company's deemed megacorps, so acting like tariffs on the megacorps to make new goods from local businesses cheaper, and hopefully promote small local businesses throughout the mid and outer rim. Ego Damask, whose secret identity was Darth Plagueis, was building this wedge between the Republic and corporations, as well as the core citizen versus everyone else, especially in the Outer Rim, playing on centuries of economic and political frustration with Coruscant. In exchange for accepting these higher taxes on megacorps, thanks to those backroom deals, the Trade Federation was given a seat in the Senate to play an active role in the regulation process. To be fair, they represented more people than most star systems out there, and before some Senate aide gets all high and mighty, there were plenty of characters like kings and queens that took part in the democratic system on Coruscant, but were the dictators of their homeworld. 
So now the Trade Federation had more legitimate political power with their seat, while Damask Holding shifted to providing loans to those thousands of entrepreneurs hoping to grow their businesses in these reformed free trade zones. Many likely found success, but still, by 33 BBY, the FTZs were still a big issue, and the megacorps had found various ways to retain power, to the point that the Senate Resolution BR0371 was proposed, a bill that would tax the free trade zones. Essentially, there'd be nothing free about it, just differently taxed at best. The Ariadu Trade Summit was held on Tarkin's homeworld, and their goal was to bring together many of the powerful worlds and corporations to try and work together and propose a counter bill, or at least a unified front against further regulation from the core. The mid-rim world Naboo was one of the most vocal leaders pushing for this summit, with Senator Palpatine proposing it to various parties. One group explicitly told not to attend was the Nebula Front, considered a terrorist group by the Senate Guard after their failed attempt to assassinate Chancellor Valorum. The Front also had major beef with the Trade Federation, who they claimed merely passed on the new cost of doing business to their customers and shippers that were all responsible for enriching the corporation. Those in attendance included Valorum, Palpatine, Tarkin, the Association of Free Trade Worlds, Commerce Guild, Corporate Alliance, Huts, Rights of Sentience League, Senex Sector, Stark Veteran Assembly, Techno Union, and the entire Directorate of the Trade Federation, and worlds including Bothawai, Clackdoor 7, Valeen, Malastare, and Sullust. You can see that many of these would become powerful leaders in the CIS. The Corporate Alliance will never allow this to happen. This is a democracy, and unlike the Republic, corporations do not rule us. And while they thought they were here to talk taxation, Palpatine had worked with his friend and fellow hater of the corrupt blue bloods of the Corps, Tarkin, to plot to remove Valorum. The Valorum family had been in politics for a thousand years. His ancestor, Tarsus Valorum, was actually the one that disbanded the military after the apparent defeat of the Sith. But this plot would not actually seek to kill Valorum. Instead, when the hacked battle droids opened fire inside of this meeting, six out of the seven directors of the Trade Federation were killed. The only one left was Newt Gunray, a man Darth Sidious would further groom for his role as a Sith pawn. Valorum was seen to have narrowly escaped from what must have been another Nebula Front terrorist attack, and though he survived, it worked to make the Chancellor and Jedi Protectors look weak, not respected by the galaxy at large. Within a year, the bill would be passed, and Sidious told his Nymordian pawn that it was time to put that Trade Federation Defense Force to good use. My lord, is that legal? I will make it legal. While on Coruscant, this act was tied to Chancellor Valorum's initiative. I move for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. Tarkin would use Ariadu's independence to keep investigations on the assassination attempt at bay all this time. And once the tensions of the Naboo conflict resulted in a no-confidence vote to oust Valorum and put in Palpatine, the investigation into the obscure mid-rim terrorists that attacked a leader no one cared about all fell apart. And while these areas were now being taxed like any other spot in the galaxy, we can wonder if some of these laws were amended or repealed over these years, but since this is how everyone referred to these areas for over 100 years at this point, they're still called the Free Trade Zones long into the Imperial Era. People gave Lucas a lot of shit about the economics in the prequels, but I think like the realistically beat up and lived in set designs, keeping things like real mythology at the core, and calling on real world politics and economics makes Star Wars great, even if you think the movies could have explained this all better or had better pacing. Well, that's it for the breakdown, and here are most of the main sources used. Likes, comments, and shares are the best way to help me out, and subscribe if you want to see more. Special thanks to our patrons, but most important of all, Remember, the term free in economics means we're just not sure who pays for it, but at the end of the day, someone will hold the bill, and the force will be with you, always.